How bright are stars? Today I want to talk a little bit about how bright they are and also how we can know what's in the star. So we're going to talk about the magnitude, that's how bright the star is, and also what the spectra of a star looks like. It's going to lead us to a classification of different stars. So we're leaving the conversation uh, about our specific star, the sun, and we're going to talk now in more general broad terms about stars. All right, so let's get on it. All right, here's kind of a cool picture of a star. I think it's a, a, a star that's gone supernova. So it's kind of a cool, amazing picture, isn't it? All right, let's talk about this thing called the magnitude scale. The magnitude scale is how bright a star is. This is the brightness of a star. All right, in 1500 BC, or 150 BC, the Greek astronomer Hippocacris measured apparent magnitude uh, using uh, uh, brightness, pardon me, measuring using something called magnitude. He kind of has a weird scale. This is going to be odd. The brightest star had a magnitude of 1, and the dimmest a magnitude of 6. It's kind of backwards, isn't it? All right, the system is still used today, and the units of measurements are called apparent magnitudes to assess how bright a star looks to the observer. Because you can see, if a star is here, uh, let's say that you're, um, well, basically, if you're closer, let's say that you're standing right here, and there's a star at this particular distance, and then there's another star that's back here, and it might be brighter. I'll make a darker box or uh, circle. It might be brighter, but to the, the, uh, the view of this observer, these two stars may actually look at the same level of brightness. It's called their apparent magnitude. So the apparent magnitude depends upon the star's luminosity, how bright it is, <coughs> Excuse me. and also the distance it is away. So a, a star may appear dim because it's far, far away, or maybe because it doesn't have much brightness, much energy being emitted. All right, so this can be confusing. First of all, the scale runs backward. High magnitude equals low brightness. I know it's kind of weird. So a 1 is bright, and a 6 is dim. OK? Although modern calibrations of these scales create negative magnitudes. There's actually ones that might have a negative 2 magnitude, and that would be very bright. OK? You'll get the idea here in just a second. All right. Now we can also measure something called the absolute magnitude. That's how bright the star actually is, okay? So the absolute magnitude is the magnitude the star would have if it was at 10 parsecs. That means if it was 10 parsecs away, which I think is like 19 million miles. So if it were, no, more than that. It's like three light years. So it's about three light years away. So if we put all the stars, if here, here you are on the Earth, and we put all the stars at three light years away, of course, the brightest one we would see, we could measure them. And so that's our absolute magnitude. The absolute magnitude of a zero, you can have a zero. I know this girl was from one to six, but we've changed that over time. Uh, if it's got a zero luminosity, it would be 100 L. What's this funny symbol? This actually, what this represents is the luminosity of our sun. So something that with a zero um, magnitude would, ha would be 100 times brighter than the sun, which would be, would be quite a bit, wouldn't it? Astronomers use a second technique to categorize the stars. This is Betelgeuse, a red giant 130 parsecs away. This is Gomeza, a small blue star 52 parsecs away. If both stars are placed at 10 parsecs, it is apparent which would appear brighter. This method is used in determining the nature of the star. This is called absolute magnitude. Consider these two objects. The flashlight is a very bright blue light, the candle is a muted yellow or red light. In this picture, the flashlight is placed 10 feet behind the candle. However, they appear to be equally bright. This represents measuring apparent magnitude. But in this picture, when the flashlight and candle are placed at an equal distance, we can see that the flashlight is much brighter than the candle. This represents measuring absolute magnitude by measuring the brightness of stars as if they were all equally distant from the Earth. All right. Now, so that's our, our quick talk about uh, magnitudes. Let's now move and talk about the spectra of stars. So if I look at a star through a spectroscope, remember spectroscopy? I must talk about spectroscopy. <laughs> that's the, the putting it like, through a prism or we did it in class um, in a lab and stuff. So the star spectrum typically depicts the energy it emits at each wavelength. Remember this little picture in the background kind of gives us, you know, the, the Roy G. Biv thing. But it can also reveal a star's composition, temperature, luminosity, 
velocity in space, rotation speed, and other properties. So if you look at a spectral, uh, the spectrum, you can find out so many things. You can find out its composition, that's what's in it, its temperature, okay, we know what that means, its luminosity, that's how bright, its velocity, how fast it's moving away from you, its rotation speed, and other properties. On certain occasions, it may even reveal mass and radius. It has to be with a binary star, as it turns out. All right, as light moves through the gas of a star's surface layers, atoms absorb radiation at some wavelengths, creating dark absorption lines in the spec star's spectrum. So this is when we're talking about its composition. How do I know what's in a star? Okay, atom, every atom creates its own unique set of absorption lines. We did a spectroscopy lab, so hopefully this will make sense. And it determines a star's surface composition, and it's then a matter of matching a star's absorption lines to those of known atoms. Write that down, but let me just show you a picture. It'll make a lot more sense. So if I have a star, not necessarily our star, any star, and then there are atoms in the star, and this is a, a picture of the atoms in the electron orbitals, all right? And as the energy from this star causes the, as these atoms, these electrons, to jump to higher levels, it creates a spectrum that looks like this. And for each of these particular lines that's jumping, like this particular line jumping up here, that matches right here to this teal line right here, bluish line, that has been, um, actually it's this one right here, uh, has been absorbed. And so we can look at this pattern and then we can determine what is in that star. So to define the qual and also to determine how much is in there, because this would be like a true for say hydrogen or helium or something like that, you could also, the darker that line is, tells you the higher the percentage of that particular element in that star. All right. Now, the, t the technique for determining the composition and abundance can be tricky. So, yeah, I don't know you need to write this down, but um, astronomers, it's not as easy as I'm kind of painting the picture. It can get harder to understand, but that's kind of the good gist of it. Sometimes we have overlap of absorption lines from several varieties of atoms being present, and that creates some of the tricky problems. Also, how, how hot it is. Um, also makes a difference. So there's a number of things that kind of create issues, but astronomers have figured these out and now can basically look at a star long, long ways away and they can say, oh, in that star there is these elements. And how fast it's going and how big it is, it's really pretty cool. Now this has led astronomers to something interesting. They can classify the stars. Classify the stars? Yeah, there's like different types of stars, okay? When they were first classified into four groups according to their color by white, yellow, red, and deep red. Um, and then they said, you know what, we need to actually change the letters and let's go A through N. So that's how they did it early and then we've kind of changed everything around, okay? We meet this gal, um, Annie Jump Cannon, and she decided um, that as she looked at stars, um, they were more orderly in appearance if they rearranged by temperature. So instead of A through N, she decided that um, the, the letters would be um, totally out of order. Now, I wish they would have rechanged the orders, but these have to do with their temperature. So we put them by coldest to hottest, where O is the coldest, I believe, and M is the hottest. I might be backwards on that, but I think that's correct.